It's good to be with you again. It's a little bit different this time around. Uh, last week, I shared on something we all found enjoyment, comfort, and nourishment. However, running the risk of being a downer today, I want to concentrate our focus and attention on the current state of our world. If last week was Psalm 1, then this week will be Psalm 13, which we will read together later. I'm sure, like all of you, in my sharing, when I'm conveying what's been on my heart, my heart has been burdened and heavy for the painful reality we find ourselves in as a human race. And if I just have to go through a brief list, in recent times, the world has and is continuing to face, firstly, the COVID pandemic. We know and we've been in it, which seems endless. We've been in it for a while as a world, but also through it all, we've also been through widespread racial and political rifts. We've been through civil unrest characterized by violent riots and destructive looting in, all over the world. So Africa was the latest event and all of us that live here and all of us that have lived here. And if you follow the news, you, you know that well. But also, what I'm going to focus a little bit in the beginning is the terrible forest fires that has been raging across the globe and this year and the last, if you take the last year from last 2020 to 2021, it's been astronomical how many forest fires we've had. It's almost as if Paul's words in Romans 8.22, reading from the Passion Translation, still echoes today throughout the whole earth. It says, To this day we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation, as if it were the contractions of labor for childbirth. Now, I'm going to share my screen in a second, and we're going to focus on the, the forest fires that I mentioned earlier, and just feel the emotion of these images that I'm sharing with you. Specifically, the images, they are images of people who suffered from the destructive devastation of the fire. So let me share my screen with you now. This picture, more than the others that I'm going to share with you, captures this anguish that I've been referring to. And I'm sure you've seen it across your social media channels or on the internet. I wish Natasha was here. She would have spoken about the how this one photo captures the emotion and the scene of this lady. Her name is Banayota Numidi. After this photo, they asked what, you know, other than, I mean, you can see her house is on fire basically and she's about to lose her home. But they ask her the context and she explains further. She said, in all the rustling or trying to get out the house and she got out, she couldn't locate her husband as the flames engulf, engulfed her home in, in the Greek island of Evia. She lost track of him and as he was assisting the nearby firefighting efforts. They did get reunited and he was safe and they both of them made it. But in this photo, she didn't know that. She lost her husband. Can you imagine that? And this picture captures her cry her cry out, out loud, for assistance from man and also from the Lord. The next picture I want to show you is a picture of Pamela Wheeler Hart. And she's telling the media that her house has been destroyed now in Perth, Australia. So the first photo was from Evia, the Greek, a Greek island. And this photo is from Perth, Australia, also in this year. The next photo... This man's name is Mike Gregorian, and he is asked to leave his home in the Juniper Hills in Little Rock, California, USA. And you can see, you can see his emotion and his anguish on his face. So just in these three pictures, we see people that, have, that are going through an emotional turmoil. They are going through physical danger and torment, and this is their response. I specifically chose these pictures for us to get to see these people as individuals, as human beings with names and experiences and them having the emotion. And I want you to try and understand the emotion these pictures capture. The last picture I'm going to show you is, is it, basically it says what it is. It says the world is grappling with massive fires. If I have to read you the quote on the top left, it says forest fires erupted in many countries from America to Europe and from Africa to Asia with rising numbers of fires in many countries compared to past years. 
And like I said, Cape Town had its own devastating fire. And we can see what the fires have done. I mean, how many countries can you see highlighted in there? If I have to rattle them off quickly, from left to right, we've got Canada, US, South America, Portugal, France, Italy, Romania, Greece, Turkey, Russia, Australia. A great deal of acreage of forest has been destroyed through forest fires. And I just wanted to, to set the scene. And I know I don't want you to get into despair because we're going to be talking about how we are to publicly respond to the, the climate of our world right now. Not just the physical climate, but the climate of emotion and, and anguish at this stage. And the question I'm asking today, and I'm asking my own heart in the last few weeks, is how are we, the sons and daughters of the living God, heirs of hope? That's who we are. We are the heirs of hope. Christ is hope, and we are His sons and daughters. How are we supposed to respond in this time of pain, sorrow, and loss? What can we do? What role do we play? This is what I want to fix our attention on today. I don't know about you, but I'm sure through this COVID pandemic, you may know of someone personal in your family that has gone on and has passed. Maybe you know of somebody who has experienced that loss. The example that is closest to me is Nicole lost a colleague in her workplace. She lost a colleague one day and he had a daughter of two and seven years old. And the next day, one of her colleagues gave birth to a brand new baby girl. And for me, that really captured my heart's attention on, on what this world is going through. Going through difficulty, but in the difficulty, there's always hope. And there's always trust in the Lord. You see, today I'm going to focus on something called lament. Right? Don't get too downcast. But you see, if we read the Bible, we cannot escape this word and this experience. The Bible is rife with people of God going through lament. Lament for the state of the world, most importantly, and also for the state of their heart. In Nehemiah 1, which all of us know well, and the scene was this, the remaining Israelites who had survived the Babylonian exile are in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Now this is what Nehemiah states as soon as he heard it. It says, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. This is what the news of his fellow Israelite brothers and sisters brought him to. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. If again I talk about Romans 8, but this time read verse 23 from the message, it says, but it's not only around us, it's within us. The Spirit of God is arousing us within. We are also feeling the birth pangs. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. You see, it's not only creation around us that is yearning and groaning for the manifestation and the fulfillment of the kingdom, but it's also the Spirit within us. Today, like I said, we're going to be talking about the biblical response of lament. Lament. Lamentations is a prayer for help coming out of pain. A prayer for help coming out of pain. It is very common, like we said in the Bible. Do you know even over, over one third of the Psalms are lament? 50. There's about 150 Psalms and over about 50 are lament. Lamentful Psalms. The prophets likewise, they cry out to God, like Jeremiah, like Habakkuk. They give phrases like, why is my pain continuous and my wounds incurable? Habakkuk says, my legs tremble beneath me. I wait, I wait the day of distress that will come upon the people who attack us. In fact, the whole, one whole book in the Bible is dedicated to lament, and that's Lamentations. Right? It expresses the confusion and the suffering felt after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians. I know this might be a bit uncomfortable for you, but the reality is we don't talk much about lament in our modern world and in churches because it is uncomfortable. But what I found is lament is misunderstood because 
we don't know much about it and we don't practice it in our contemporary churches or communities. But today we see the trauma in the world increasing. For my generation at least, we didn't, many of us haven't lived through war or world war. We haven't seen global pandemics or sufferings to the scale that we have today. So therefore, we need more grace. More grace is needed. The loss of lament in our modern society has had serious consequences, including a lack of compassion for pain bearers. If we can't f- share in their pain, how can we identify and help? You see, this is a failure of challenging injustice and essential the loss of of our church's mission to bring hope into pain. That is why we are here. We are the peacemakers and the hope bringers. We have Jesus within us. We have the hope, but we need to identify and feel the pain of the hurting world in order to minister to them and and to heal their hearts through Jesus Christ. I'm just going to go quickly and try and give you some points on what, what does it mean to lament? So I've got some points here. Firstly, and most importantly, lament is a cry lifted up towards God. It's a cry lifted up towards God. i got a quote here. It says, When we feel blessed in life, when we experience goodness and wholeness, we turn to God in praise and thanksgiving. But what happens when we experience just the opposite? What happens when we are overcome by the presence of chaos, brokenness, suffering and death? Or a sudden sense of a human vulnerability. I'm sure all of us have have experienced that before. When we hurt physically, we cry out in pain. When we hurt, and they say religiously, we cry out in lament. It's a cry lifted up towards God, first of all. Secondly, lament is not despair. It is not despair. Lament is not despair. It is not whining. It is not a cry into a a deep, dark void. It is a cry directed to God, like we said. It is a cry of those who seek the truth of the world's deep wounds and the cost of seeking peace, like we saw in Nehemiah's response. It is the prayer of those who are deeply disturbed by the way things are. Some people call that a righteous discontent. But it has to start from pain. It has to start with not being happy or, or, or fulfilled in what we are experiencing now. If I had to take you back to the Old Testament and the wilderness, we see Israel complaining here to God for a lack of bread and meat and water. You see, this is not lament. They assumed the worst about God, not the best. They assumed the worst about Him. They said He's trying to kill us, take us back. That is whining and complaining, right? The people who had been dramatically rescued from Egypt, they just saw the Lord's hand move mightily and powerfully. We saw the acts in which he did to bring out Egypt. They have the fiery pillar and they have got a cloud. They see the Lord's hand. It's not like he's far from them, which we will see later in other lamentations. Right? Their complaints were actually a way of putting God on trial. Like we do with our politicians when we don't get what we want. They were in a way testing the Lord. But in the Psalms, Israel asks God to answer according to his nature, according to his character, according to his unfailing love. You see, in the wilderness, where the Israelites wandered for a whole generation and died out, that was not lament. They were not finding the truth in in God's character and nature. Rather, they were assuming the worst. They were seeing him as a hard God. God is a God of righteousness and a God of justice. And because he has been faithful in the past, he will continue to be so in the future. If we contrast Israel in the wilderness with Israel in worship, we can say that complaint is an accusation against God that maligns his character. But lament is an appeal to God based on his confidence in his character. I want you to understand the difference. We need to check our own hearts if we are complaining and grumbling out of displeasure and out of accusing God of not treating us the way we want to be treated, very self-focused. You know, uh, uh, Simon Sinek defines the difference between complaining and feedback. If you're ever in a workplace and you want to know, are you someone who's complaining or are you giving feedback? He says, well, who is the central focus of your voice? If If you're feeling sorry for yourself, 
If it's about how you're affected and how you're not getting what you'd like and this is not working out for you, guess what? You're complaining. If you're more concerned on how, or how people around you are going to be affected or the person you're giving it to that can be used for benefit for their ultimate good, even though it may be painful, it might not be good. Feedback is not always easy to receive. But if it's ultimately for their good and not any selfish motive from your side, or as little as possible, then it's most likely feedback. I believe it's the same with the Lord. Are we there? Are we airing our grievances just because we don't feel rightfully treated? Or are we really concerned for the state of the world, the state of our family, the state of our homes, the state of our nations, and yes, the state of our hearts? Are we questioning God's nature or are we seeking His heart, even though the situation is uncomfortable? Right? The third point is lament is getting honest with God. You see, the situations we find ourselves in, or most of us or the world, isn't pleasant. So it isn't denying the reality thereof. It's opening up our hearts and telling the Lord how we see things. Again, not in complaint, but in honesty. Lament pours out your heart and your heart cry honestly and forcefully. It is a way to deal with our stresses and grief by interacting with God in stark honesty. Prayers of lament are honest before God and bring us face to face with Him as we try to understand what's going on in our heart. That's the key. We know His, his nature, which we're going to discuss later, later. But we're trying to understand what's going on inside our heart, why all this, the situation doesn't seem right, and we're wrestling with it. It's good to open up your heart. It's good to even though it may be painful, just express it honestly and brutally. Eugene Peterson says something so beautiful, yet simple. He says, praying is not being nice before God. It's being open before God. Prayer is not being nice before God, but being open before God. And the last point for this section is lament helps us regird our trust and renew our confidence in the Lord. That is the purpose for lament and that is the key. Lament helps us regird our trust in the Lord and renew our confidence in Him. Lament is a form of prayer. It is more than just an expression of sorrow or venting emotion. Lament talks to God about your pain and it has a unique purpose which is trust. It is divinely given it's a divinely given invitation to pour out our fears, our frustrations, our sorrows. For what? For the purpose of helping us renew our confidence in the Lord. I'm going to take you through an example. I think it's important that you see it in front of you and we break it down and we take it slowly and we try to unpack an example of lament. And like I said, that's going to be Psalm 13. We're going to be camped out here for a while. So if you can turn to Psalm 13 in your Bible, have it in front of you and I'm going to break it down section by section and we're going to unpack it based on the characteristics and nature of lament we just gave earlier. Psalm 13, a biblical example of lament. I'm going to read it once through so you get the whole flow of the psalm first and then we're going to break it down. I'm going to read from the Amplified Translation. And it's got a heading there. It says, Pray for help in trouble to the chief musician, a psalm of David. So this is David speaking. He says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart day after day? How long will my enemies exalt himself and triumph over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light, give life to my eyes, or I sleep the sleep of death. And my enemies will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted and relied on and been confident in your loving kindness and your faithfulness. My heart shall rejoice and delight in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Isn't that a beautiful, emotive psalm? Let's start with the first section, which I've titled, How Long, O Lord? Verse 1 and 2, verse 1 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? If 
Folks, I don't know about you, but this is a question I've been directing to the Lord a lot lately. How long, O oh Lord, must we endure? How long must we endure whatever you're going through? If it's the pandemic, if it's anything, how long must we remain isolated in this pandemic? David asked this question four times in the opening five lines of the poem. Can you feel his desperation? How long, O oh Lord? All of us have inquired how long at one time or another, no matter who we are. Your experience raises shouts of desperation as if the Lord is distant. Right? We know He isn't, but our experience tells us something else. But note to whom these shouts are directed. This is the key. Personally and intimately, David talks directly to the Lord. Even though he feels he's distant, he directs it, he talks to the Lord. A person lamenting critically directs their painful release to the Lord. Talking to the Lord about what is happening. Even if we know he already knows. If I speak to the parents out there and I say to you, if your child is in pain or in deep distress, no matter how old they are, if they are a toddler or if they are a teenager or if they are in their adult life and have families of their own, If you know your child is in deep pain and distress, wouldn't you like them to come to you and tell you about it face to face, personally? It's the same with our our father. He wants to hear from us personally and intimately. Then he can bring us comfort and and consolation. How long? It's important we, we are open and honest with the Lord and talk to him directly. If we look at the next section from verse 2. Which, st- which says, how long must I take counsel in my soul? Having sorrow in my heart day after day. That phrase really hits me. Having sorrow in my heart. How long must I take counsel in my soul? During prayers of lament, we open our hearts before the Lord. David tells of his daily and seemingly endless sorrow in his heart. Biblical lament humbly and honestly identifies the pain, the questions, the frustrations raging in our souls. It pinpoints them, it identifies them, and it lifts them and directs them to the Lord. For me, personally, this is one of the most important, powerful, and needed aspects of lament. The raw, unfiltered honesty David has with the Lord. You see, I don't know about you, but some of us, Avoid sharing our pain. We avoid sharing our emotions, our feelings, both with the Lord and with man. I'm guilty of this just as you are. Or maybe if you are. The Lord says we declare scriptures with barely any meaning behind them like Christian catchphrases. We say things like, I can do all things through Christ. We say things like, all things work together for the good. We say things, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Are saying these things wrong? No, they're not wrong. But speaking them out if you don't deeply and personally personally mean them are. I want to be real with you people. If we're saying these things as a a knee-jerk reaction when someone asks how you're doing and we just say it even though it's not a reality in our soul, I think we we are uttering like Jesus calls vain repetitions. We are just saying things to give an easy answer and to cover up. Like modern day mantras. I'm not a fan of mantras to be honest. And the world believes in mantras too. You know, they wake up and no matter how they're feeling, they try and sp- they just try and say things in order to just change things. Does that have some effects and results? I would say it does. But I also believe in opening your heart honestly and openly before the Lord and letting Him see the gunk that's there. And let, let, let airing all the gunk before Him that He can fill it with His word. Fill it with his hope. Fill it with his nature and his character. He will clean it up in his quiet time with you and he will minister to your soul. If we just share these things and we don't really mean them, they are phrasal facades. They cover up, they hide our heart and they harden our heart. Before the Lord and before men. God will always resist the proud, but he will always give grace to the humble. This is his nature. He helps and he blesses the brokenhearted and the mournful. Jesus changes the way we see things. He flips it upside down in Matthew 5, on the Sermon on the Mount. He proclaims a series of blessings. Not blessings based on 
on position, based on wealth, based on pr prosperity. He says this, he says, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When I studied this for, for my Bible school, I was tremendously, tremendously blessed. That you see, they bless not because they're in it. They bless because they're in a position to receive the nature of Christ and of God. The people who are poor in spirit are able to receive His richness in spirit. The people who are mourn are able to receive His comfort. The people who are pure in heart will be able to engage with the Lord in transparency and honesty because He likes someone to worship Him in sincerity and in truth. That's how He wants relationship. He doesn't want relationship like we know today in our modern world. He wants true, deep, meaningful relationships with us. Folks, please understand what I'm saying. I'm urging you to bear your heart before God and if necessary before your brothers and sisters. Be truthful. True biblical faith, hope and trust is grounded in God's character, God's nature, as well as His ability. God loves us loyally, graciously, mercifully, compassionately. That is who He is. He has rescued and provided for us in the past and He will do so again because that is who He is. There's a beautiful song that ministered to me and I think it's caught the heart of many a believer in this time and that's his nature. I, I think I forget the singer, I think it's Carrie Job, but it's a tremendous song that has really encouraged me. It it does the song really just opens up your heart and it opens up those questions of are you trusting in God in situations that you're finding difficulty in? And it says God will do so because it's who he is. He is love. It is in his nature. He knows no other way. You see, David knew God's nature. He doesn't just experience him and the fruits. You know, he doesn't just experience his hand. He knows his heart. And he desperately voices his lament because he looks around him and his circumstances voice the disparity of what's going on doesn't reflect God. You know, I'm reminded of Psalm 42. I'm sure all of you know, as the deer pants for the water, there's a popular song. But I've discovered that it may mean as the hunted deer pants for the water. Maybe a better translation would be as a hunted deer dying of thirst pants for water. So my soul longs for you, O God. The sons of Korah in that psalm, which is actually a psalm of lament, Psalm 42, are longing for the presence of the Lord once again. They don't have it and they are longing for it. And they are like a deer that is hunted, is thirsting. He, they want the Lord's presence. This is what it means to know the Lord's nature, to know His character, to, in, to be intimate and to experience Him. Let's go on to the next section from verse 3, which says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Consider and answer me. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. Again, the point of lament is to bear your heart before the Lord and ask for help. You've heard it in the human context that asking for help doesn't make, you, doesn't make you less human. In fact, it's the most human thing about us that we cannot achieve everything on our own. We need our brothers and sisters. We need the Lord. We need to ask for His help. David is asking the Lord to consider and answer Him. If we don't... If we don't want to let out that sorrow and we can, we, we run the risk of creating a deadly silence and we run the risk of going into despair where there is no hope and we just deny everything that everything is fine. No, everything's fine. I'm okay. I'm okay. A lot of people say everything is fine and okay until they burn out and reach despair. But you see what lament does, it invites us to dare to hope in the Lord's promises as we ask for help. We dare to hope in God's promises as we ask for His help. Like David said in that section, we need to ask the Lord to give light and life to our eyes. Faith is not a simple intellectual assent to some statement about God. It's not memorizing something and saying, I'm just going to memorize it. God is this. No, it's trusting of our entire being, our whole selves to God. At times, 
we do experience things that speak contrary to that. We do feel that we are alone and confused and in doubt. But doubt is not opposed to faith. Despair is. We see David here in his doubt. He's feeling alone. He's feeling confused. And in his doubt, in his doubt he directs it and he goes to God. But note he doesn't want to enter into despair. Lament is not a gateway to despair. It is the opposite. He had the wisdom to know that his vision was clouded and dark. So he cried out to the Lord, enlighten my eyes. Folks, we need the light of God to shine upon us and give us his wisdom and knowledge. No matter what problem we're in. Dad has been speaking about this in his messages of greatness. He says, go to the Lord in your deserts. Ask for wisdom. Ask where you are. Ask for his water to be given. Ask for the light to be given to your eyes. Enlighten my eyes, David says. God can shine his light into our eyes that we may see. This is key. That is where change begins in the way we see. Allow God to cast out the darkness by shining his light. But you need to open your eyes to him and to it. The last section from verse 5, which is, I'm sure all of you resonate because that's where things turn around. With a, it says there, but I have trusted. That is such an impactful statement. But I have trusted. Past tense. Relied on and been confident in your loving kindness and faithfulness. My heart shall rejoice and delight in your salvation. Now listen to the present tense. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt dealt bountifully with me. Can you see the focus of tenses there? See, David has tasted and known the evidence of God's character. Just like the Israelite nation. They know God's character. In Exodus, he was revealed as a loving, loyal, compassionate, merciful God. He rescued them. They know this. They have a heritage of knowing the Father. So does David in his life. We know David's life is characterized by many ups, but a great deal of downs as well. But when he goes through these downs, he doesn't hide it. He doesn't bury it down. He releases it out and he declares it to the Lord. And he stands on the evidence of the nature of God because he's experienced that goodness. These verses from verse 5 are the hinge in which David's faith in God swings open. I want you to see it as a hinge. The phrase, but I have trusted, is a hinge in which David's faith in God swings open. This is the result of true lament. Trust and choosing trust in the Lord will always be the result of true lament. Trust. It's all about trust and choosing that trust. True lament is grounded in God's nature and so it ends with the realization and revelation that our whole beings are in his hands. David, after his prayer, came to a place of confidence and trust. I have trusted, speaks in the past tense, like we said. It is as if David remembered that he really did trust God. He comes to a realization that he does. And he cleared the way, the fog from his sleepy eyes, and as God enlightened them. You see, lament gives us that opportunity to taste and remember. It helps us clear out the rubbish and remember the good. Lament is a juxtaposition. It's contrasting of God's bountiful and faithful nature to our desolate despair and our circumstances. It forces all our fears and anxieties and doubts and pain and worry to the surface of our heart and then we cry them out. We release them. We cry them out. And we ask God to deal with them and deal with our heart. Then all the gunk is out. Then the Lord can begin His work. He reminds us firstly of who he is and his love for us. And indeed, he reminds us and we remind ourselves of our love for him. I'm going to repeat that phrase because it's very important. When all the gunk is out, when we've released everything, the Lord can then begin his work. He reminds us of who he is and his love for us. And also, we remember our love for him. Folks, True lament ends in biblical hope, biblical trust and faith. It does not end in despair. 
Our circumstances may not have changed. The world circumstances may not have changed overnight. But our heart sure has. When we go to the Lord in prayerful lament, our heart will change. The Lord will use our changed heart and our reinvigorated heart for His working and the working out of the situation. We are the ones to bring hope to the hopeless. Through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit within us, we can only do that if hope is alive and burning in our hearts. Remember our words earlier. Lament talks to God about pain. It has a unique purpose, which is trust. It is a divinely given invitation to pour out our fears, our frustrations and our sorrows for the purpose of helping us renew our confidence in the Lord. Let me close with Romans 8 once again, this time reading from verse 24 from the message. These sterile and barren bodies of ours are yearning for full deliverance. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy. In sharing today, I wanted to just, I'm sure you know, the world is hurting. And maybe some of you are hurting along with it. Please, do not ignore and bury the pain and doubt. Do not give, I call them, fragile facades. Don't just say things because you think that's what people want to hear. Talk to the Lord. Go to Him. Let Him know how you feel. He does want to hear all about it. He wants to hear your heart. And if you're not going through a difficult time, then participate in the world's pain. They need prayer of intercession to be given up to the Lord, just like Nehemiah, where he was in a place of comfort and, and prosperity and position, being the king's cupbearer, he couldn't go a moment longer knowing his nation is in dire straits. And he goes in a fast and prayer. If you are in a good place, but your heart is grieving for the world, take it to the Lord, intercede for them on their behalf, plead with them. We see biblical characters over and over again, even Jesus, intercedes for us today for the state of the world. Lament is not only for the suffering, it is for the solidarity with the suffering, is a quote. We love our neighbor when we allow the experience of pain to become the substance of our prayer rather. Like Nehemiah, like Habakkuk, the world needs our prayerful participation in their grieving so the Lord can work a change, first within us, in our hearts, and then in the world. That is what I wanted to share with you today. I hope you understood and caught my heart in sharing. I found it difficult to put it to words because a lot of us, it makes us uncomfortable. Me sharing it is not really comfortable. It's not easy. But it's not easy seeing the pain out there. It's not easy seeing loss of life to such the state that we had and have. The fires that are raging, I feel, as a metaphor for the world right now. Never have we been so divided. Well, maybe we have. The world goes through cycles. But maybe in our generation, we've never experienced it like this. We need to go to the Lord, folks. As a community and as individuals, we need to lift up our neighbors and our families and our nations to the Lord. Because if we don't, who will? Dear Father, Lord... Thank you for your for your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that as Romans speaks, Lord, that your spirit within us would just utter these hard phrases, Lord, to you, Lord Jesus. True, deep, open, yearning. If in the spirit, if it needs to be in the spirit, let it be in the spirit. Let it groan and utter. Let us go to you, Lord Jesus, and just participate in the world's grieving right now. Let us mourn. And let us not stay on our knees, but let us be lifted up in your presence, Lord. Let the world be lifted up in your presence. Let us place the world before your feet. Let us say, not our will, but your will be done, Lord Jesus. Help us to be that change, to be that light, to be that hope in this world that needs it so desperately. But help us not turn a, turn a blind eye to it. Help us not harden our hearts 
Help us not bury our heads in the sand, Lord Jesus, and, and worry about our own corner and our own family. Help us look up and see. Help us see our brothers and sisters who need you, that their only hope is you. Their only rejoice and joyful experience will be you. Help us share your name, your passion, your nature with them, Lord Jesus. Let it begin with us, Lord. Lord, it's easy to talk about but Lord, help us take it to our quiet rooms, Lord, in our quiet places. Help us, let it start there. Let it begin on our knees, Lord. Let, let us remember our brothers and sisters. And we thank you for this time, Lord Jesus, together. And we dedicate it to you in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.